very important thing, you know. So, um, no questions, huh? Then I'm going to start. All right. Yay. So we're going to do photosynthesis. I can write right through the computer way we're going to make this. We're going to talk about some photosynthesis. Uh, uh, and we're going to have a dark reaction, not a light reaction, of course. We're going to have a dark reaction. You know, but I think you're missing it. I'm actually a, a lecture behind, but we'll catch up because I haven't sure changed these things. Um, yeah, that's the main thing. Like that. And, and I'll put some things we're going to talk about after that. We're going to talk about DNA, DNA, RNA, <coughs> protein synthesis. We won't get to all this stuff. I mean, this is just the kind of the beginning. But I'll, I'll put down some things when we get there. <laughs> okay, I know. So, um, let's, let's, let's review some stuff that we had. Actually, we had it last Monday. So it wasn't on this exam. Remember that was cellular respiration? We're not going to review all the cellular respiration, but we're just, whoops, cellular. Um, we're just going to review the basic idea here. And that is, it's the complete breakdown of sugar. sugar and we're going to talk about sugar. We can talk about that. It's the same idea, but the weak breakdown of sugar to CO2 and water, right? mm -hmm. inorganic, uh, um, inorganic uh, molecules. So it's a complete breakdown <coughs> of sugar to CO2. <coughs> And water. <coughs> and that, these note are these are inorganic molecules. Inorganic and very stable. <coughs> so we start with, let's just write this down in terms of and you don't have to I don't care that you memorize the chemical formula, but let's C6, H12, O6. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's glucose, simple sugar. And we use up, it's aerobic, meaning we use oxygen, six oxygens. We get out of it six CO2s plus six waters plus <coughs> 36 ATP. Remember for, for fermentation, how many did we get? Two. two. Just two! Ah, that's not very many. So a lot more ATP. <coughs> Pretty energy efficient, you know, in the, in the sense of being the, trapping the usable energy. The rest that we do lose is heat and all that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it says breakdown of sugars, but does it include fat? Or? Well, okay, I didn't put it up, but fatty acids would the same thing. Okay. We could have have up here a complete breakdown of fatty acids to CO2 and water. Same idea. Okay. But it gets more. It gets a little more ATP for, for, for carbon or for six carbons or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more efficient, actually. Yeah, but but I, I'm just going to leave it at this just for, okay. for convenience purposes. Okay. So this is great. As long as we have sugar, and I'm not just saying we meaning humans or something, but I'm talking about organisms. And remember, I said that the beginning of this process, the glycolysis part, most organisms on Earth can do that. They don't all do cellular respiration. You know, but most organisms on Earth can do the glycolysis part. Uh, a lot of them do fermentation to, as, a, as a complete process. They don't do the cellular respiration. Who does cellular respiration? Let's write this down. So, well, okay, now let's be a little more general. So, all eukaryotic organisms <coughs> And some bacteria. Bacteria, of course, are prokaryotic. But there are some bacteria that are aerobic. Now, where does it take place in eukaryotic organisms? Mitochondria. In the mitochondria. Not the glycolysis part, right? In the beginning, that glycolysis takes Which place. Is the in the cytoplasm. But, but all the rest of the stuff, the, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport, that's all in the mitochondria. So, so, in, so, um, 
in eukaryotic organisms. Eukaryotic cells, I'll say. Uh, Krebs, oops, that's supposed to be Krebs. Krebs plus the ETS <laughs> occur in the mitochondria. Again, you know, remember, of course, that the glycolysis is out in the cytoplasm. But remember, in glycolysis, what do you end up with in glycolysis? Two. Two pyruvic acids. Two. And the two ATP. We'll leave those out for the moment. Just the two pyruvic acids. They diffuse into the mitochondria, and then, then they, you know, then you do the Krebs cycle and all that. So, what I started to say a minute ago was as long as we have glucose, this is great. We get all this energy. We can do whatever we need to do. And I'm talking about not just humans, but I'm talking about. All, all eukaryotic organisms, or actually bacteria for that matter, the ones that do the cellular respiration, as long as we have glucose available, great, we're, we're in great shape. Uh, well, we could run out of glucose, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? So there needs to be some way to keep remaking glucose. There it is. And that's the subject of today's <laughs> lecture, photosynthesis. So let's talk about photosynthesis. Um, by the way, just, 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 I mentioned, I think it was in this lecture, it might have been the other, other group, that the origin, the origin of mitochondria, did I mention this one? Yeah. The origin of mitochondria, what they think was probably a particular aerobic bacteria. bacteria. And I told you there is a particular, I, I, I think it was this class, I mentioned the name, not that you need to know about it, it's Paracoccus denitrificans, but if you look at the, that little bacterium, and you look at all the respiratory enzymes, like all the Krebs cycle enzymes, uh, and, and the uh, respiratory chain in the, in the mito, you know, that inner uh, membrane of the mitochondria, almost identical in the mitochondria to what's in this one particular <laughs> bacterium. <laughs> And the, the, the thought is that, that maybe, maybe not that particular bacteria, but something incredibly closely related to it, was the origin of all the mitochondria. They're about the same size, that bacteria and mitochondria. Um, mitochondria have their own little bit of DNA. They grow and divide like bacteria do, not like regular cells, a lot like eukaryotic cells do. Uh, and there's all these other things that are so similar. And so they, it looks like, you know, it looks like, that some aerobic bacterium, a relative maybe of this Paracoccus guy I mentioned, was the origin three billion years ago of all the mitochondria. And all the mitochondria in all organisms, you know, pretty much, pretty much alike. There's no variance occasionally here and there because we're talking, you know, three billion years of evolution, so uh, you expect some variance. But but basically they're all alike. You know. So it's pretty wild, pretty weird. The, the origin of our mitochondria. I mean, not just ours, but all eukaryotic organisms, with some bacterium that presumably was engulfed by some organism that just could do fermentation, you know. And then, you know, it engulfed this aerobic bacterium. Instead of dying, that bacterium stayed alive, and it got nutrients because this other cell went out and ate up nutrients and provided, you know, did the glycolysis part, provided the pyruvic acids that went into this bacterium that became the mitochondria, and then it went ahead and, you know, Further process it with the Krebs cycle and ETS, providing all this extra ATP for the, that the big organism. And so it became this nice symbiotic relationship where they're both helping each other. And eventually they depended upon each other with all the changes over all the evolutionary uh, years. They, they depend upon each other. And so this is called the endo, you don't have to know this for an exam, the endosymbiont theory. It's, in other words, it was a symbiotic relationship, but endo because inside. it got engulfed, and so it's inside now. You know, this bacterium is inside. But now, you know, they can take cells, they can remove all the, back, all the mitochondria from the cell, and the cell will be okay for a few minutes, you know, you know but it really can't, do well, it can't get enough energy to do what it needs to do. <laughs> so it doesn't do really very well. And you can take these little mitochondria temporarily, let them grow in a test tube, and give them, you know, pyruvic acids, and they'll do it. For a while they'll be okay, but they, they need some help from the cell. So now they're totally interdependent on each other. And if you remove the, the, the mitochondria from a cell, 
and you know you can't do it. You have to do special techniques, you know. Mm. But I mean, if, if if that's done, that cell can't get any mitochondria back again. It doesn't have the genetic information to make, you know, these these mm. mitochondria. The mitochondria has it, you know. And how do you get new mitochondria? As I said, in your cells, you grow them. They grow them to buy. That's the way bacteria. Do. So it's a wild idea. Uh, no way we can ever prove it because we don't have any, you know, webcams that were three billion years ago. <laughs> <laughs> what was happening? But anyway, it's kind of, but it's a, it's a neat idea. Well, we'll see the same thing with photosynthesis. It's it's part of the determinist theory, I'm sure. But yeah. <laughs> at any rate, okay. So my point here was that. We need some to get this a new supply of, of glucose, and and so that's where photosynthesis comes in. Uh, let's talk about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. So the function of photosynthesis is to you use uh, use the energy of the sun uh, and CO two. And water to make <laughs> glucose. <coughs> and if you want the, the formula, look at the formula. Six CO2 plus six waters. And then you put an arrow here. I'm going to put this. I'm going to put this is what they put H nu. Now that looks pretty fancy. That means energy from the sun, the sunlight. <coughs> It's not just sunlight, but that's Planck's constant times the frequency of light. No, you don't need to know about that. Sunlight. The energy of sunlight <laughs> gives you C6H12 6 and a byproduct of six oxygen molecules. That looks... It's exactly... Look at this. Yeah. It's exactly the opposite. Now, the reactions aren't exactly the opposite, but it is, it is the opposite in the sense of, you know, with respiration, we're going this direction. Photosynthesis, we're going this that, direction. Okay. If we're doing respiration, we're going this way, and we're getting ATP out of it. If we're going this way, we have to put energy into the system, but the energy is the sunlight. Okay, we'll talk briefly about that. So it's kind of wild. So, you know, one of the points I was trying to make on the exam is that second law of thermodynamics, you're, you know, life is very ordered, but yet... You know, I mean, life is very ordered, but yet the second law of thermodynamics says, hey, you know, uh, uh, everything is getting <coughs> more disorganized because every reaction, the entropy increases, which is disorder. But the only reason you can have ordered, you know, organized living things on this earth is because we have this constant input of energy. And if with that, without that constant <coughs> input of energy, no, there's no way that life could persist, as we know it anyway. So, um, who does photosynthesis? Let's say who does that. Okay, let's say, well, uh, some bacteria, all blue-green bacteria. These are very, you know, we divide bacteria into the blue-greens and the other ones we call true bacteria or regular bacteria or, you know, whatever you want to call them. Obviously, all other bacteria. Um, all, but so, I mean, I mean, just other bacteria. So, all blue-green bacteria. So when I say some bacteria, that's all the other kinds other than the blue-greens. Okay, so some regular bacteria photosynthesize, all blue-green bacteria photosynthesize, and um, all eukaryotic organisms that have, have what? Chloroplasts. Eukaryotic cells that have chloroplasts, right? <coughs> <coughs> Of course, what does that mean? Plants, plants, algae, and a few other organisms. Mainly plants and algae, but there are a few protozoa that have some some uh, uh, chloroplasts. That are what autotroph cell feeding or something like that. I forget the details on it. Yeah. I know one thing. Right, they, they don't photosynthesize. Yeah, no, no, that's right. You know, 
superficially you look at a fungus, well, like a mushroom growing, say, oh, it looks like a plant coming up, but it's not green, you know. Mm. And but you're right, it's, it's it's decomposing, it's getting nutrients from the soil and whatever is decomposing, no no photosynthesis. But photosynthesis is good because you're getting energy from the sun too to do what? To make, make sugar. Now notice this is the this this particular kind of photosynthesis giving off oxygen is what all the blue greens do and all the chloroplasts do. Um, so if I put this up here, some bacteria, these, but these don't give off. These don't. You don't need to know about these. I'm just mentioning things. They have, these don't give off oxygen, whereas these all these all give off oxygen. So it's it's not a big deal for our purposes. These other guys, um, we're mainly concentrating on the chloroplasts. And what the blue greens would do. Um, so, so does that mean glucose is basically crystallized sunlight? <laughs> crystallized sunlight. I would like the word. I never thought. Well, I mean, that's kind of what's sunlight. crystallized energy. <laughs> crystallized so that's a good. One. I love it. That's All right. Good. No, well, <laughs> yeah. Let's just say it's the it's the product of using energy from the sun. Yeah. I'm using these guys to put it together. Okay. Now, you know. Um, uh, couple things I want to say before we get into some of the details, and that is, um, uh, 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 oh yeah, just in terms, remember I mentioned about the, the, the endosymbiont during the origin of, uh, of mitochondria, we said we think it was some bacteria, you know, way back then, aerobic bacteria. Well, it turns out that there is one, there's a whole bunch of blue-green bacteria, I don't, I have no idea how many different species there are, but there's, again, one particular blue-green bacterium that has all the, 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 the things that it uses to, to do photosynthesis, all the chlorophyll products, all the uh, uh, membrane bound, I mean the uh, uh, electron transport system and all that, all the, all the enzymes and carriers are almost identical to what's in chloroplasts. So again, they think that some cell that had engulfed a, 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 a paracontus and became a, a thing became a mitochondria, maybe at some time one of those cells engulfed a particular blue green. And again, it, it, was, it was nice and happy because it was nice and protected, and it could get exposed to the light, it could provide sugar to the cell, and the cell could provide various things to it. And, and so, again, part of that endosymbiont there, maybe, that maybe originally a, the chloroplast and all these eukaryotic cells were originally one particular kind of blue green. Kind of a wild idea. I think these are really nifty ideas. And again, the same thing with blue greens. How do, I mean, not blue greens, the same thing with chloroplasts. As mitochondria that I was talking about, how do you get new? How does a cell, a plant cell, say, get new chloroplasts? They grow and divide. They grow and divide, like bacteria, and and uh, they've got their own DNA. And again, if you remove all the chloroplasts from uh, a cell, the cell cannot make its own chloroplasts. They only get new chloroplasts by growing and dividing. So it's kind of wild. Right? So certain parts of the plant have more chloroplasts, like maybe the leaves have more chloroplasts. There may be some differences. I, I, you know, I'm good at the molecular biology, but I'm not so good in botany, <laughs> so I don't want to say. <laughs> you can, yeah, that that you can ask Colette. She's a botanist. <laughs> so ask yeah. A botanist and see. Yeah. But, you know, there may be, but I don't want to say yes or no. So uh, let's go back and think about things. Um, where did all the CO2 come from? In, in. Um, Respiration. In the fermentation? It, no, 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 not, 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 well, we tiny bit in some fermentations, but most of it came from. The right now? Krebs cycle. Right? Yeah, Krebs yeah, cycle. They're pulling yeah. off the CO2. So, they times, came yeah. off, you know, every so often. Uh, okay. When did we make water in the electron transport system? That was during fermentation. The, the oh, no, no, oh. Remember the final acceptor of all those electrons That's that are going okay. to the electron transport system? Oxygen yeah, yeah, yeah. to make water. Yeah. So, okay, th this is this is going to be interesting because uh, you'll see the the what's going to be happening in photosynthesis. But as I said, I'm not going to go into excessive detail. I'm going to tell you a little bit about photosynthesis to give you the idea of how it works. And we're going to be talking about chloroplasts, okay? Um, so we divide we divide photosynthesis into what's called a light reaction and a dark reaction. So let me put down what these mean. And then we'll say a little bit more about it. Remember my RXN for my abbreviation for light reaction. Right. 
Direct reaction is also called the Calvin cycle. Because Melvin Calvin, uh, you know, did most of the work and determined how it worked. And I think I told you guys that I was taking organic, I'm pretty sure I told you, maybe I told you in the review session, I was on my way to my organic chemistry class at Berkeley. This is 1961, I think. And I was on the way to my organic chemistry class, taught by Melvin Calvin. And the headlines of the Chronicle were, Calvin wins Nobel. I'm going, oh my God, I'm going to his class right now. He's got the Nobel Prize. Pretty well. We gave him a standing ovation, but you know, not that that meant. I mean, he's, thank you, you guys, but I mean, we were these little lowly undergraduates, and he's one of the most famous chemists in the whole world. <laughs> but still, you know, it's, it's, it, was, it was cool, you know. At least um, he was your teacher. But anyway, okay, so light reaction. What happens in the light reaction, and I said, I'll give you a little bit of detail after this, but the basic idea, what happens in the light reaction is that the, the energy, energy of light, from light, from sunlight, um, excites some electrons, and it goes through an electron transport system. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. It's, a, it's a different electron transport system, but it's the same idea as when we have the ETS over there, and that, you know, the current mm -hmm. cycle ETS. It's the same idea with electrons going through the electron transport system. The energy of light excites electrons. Um, which then goes through an electron transport system. Okay. <coughs> um, some similarities would make ATP. And it, that was a big thing we made in the electron transport system in the bottom country was ATP, right? So again, we're going to be making some ATP. And this is not we, but I'm going to talk to Professor. But they're going to, as these electrons go through this electron transport system and make some ATP, and they make a whole bunch of a. It's a re reduced coenzyme. Remember the coenzymes? Mm -hmm. the, the helpers, plus yeah. Becoming an ADH. So they make. What's called NADPH is similar. NADPH, and I don't want you to make a big deal out of it. I'm just going to say what NADPH is. You know, it reduces coenzyme. You, you, you just, just without worrying about the details, we'll, we'll you know, accept it. The P means it's an extra phosphate. That's the only difference between mm -hmm. NADH plus NADPH. Um, it's a carrier. It's a, it's a strong reducing agent, but I, I don't even want to talk about that because that just gets things confused. Light reaction. What we're doing? We're, we're getting excited electrons uh, and we make <laughs> ATP and this reduced coenzyme. I mean, just, just think of it as a reduced coenzyme. It's going to allow us to reduce some molecules. I think it's going to talk about it. Okay. Um, Let's talk about these electrons for just a second. First of all, when you look at pictures in the book, they'll show me that sometimes I mentioned this, I think they show an arrow with the electron, like, you know, it looks like it's going up. What they're doing is showing you energy. It's gaining energy. And remember I said electrons can't just fly off into the air. They have to be handed from one thing to another. So when the electrons get excited, they're picked up by a carrier. But they're high energy, so they can go through this transport system and as the energy gets lower, some of that energy is trapped by making ATP. Okay, that's good. And some of it's trapped by making this reduced coenzyme. Um, where, where, what was the final acceptor over here for the electrons? Oxygen. Oxygen to make water, right? To make water? Yeah. Okay. In this case, it's exciting some electrons. There has to be some. There, there's, there are electrons in, in these pigment molecules, you know, that make the uh, chlorophyll and there's some other pigments too. But those are those are the various pigments in the chlorophyll. I mean, chlor in the chloroplast, chlorophyll, and these other pigments. They absorb light. They absorb certain wavelengths of light, and that'll excite excite their electrons. Okay. But you know, if they just start getting having their electrons excited and get picked up by somebody else, they'd run out of electrons pretty soon. So there has to be some way to 
get those electrons back. And guess what the origin of the electrons is? Water! Here, where did those electrons end up in this electron transfer system? They yeah. ended up in water. You know, the oxygen you know, was the final acceptor. So the, the origin of electrons is going to be uh, ultimately water. So these ultimately come from water. But what's going to happen is the water is going to be broken apart into hydrogen ions and electrons. And what's going to be left over? Oxygen. Oxygen, which is going to come off as O2. Okay. So these ultimately come from, from water. And I'll just say um, as H plus so and Jack's E minus with O2 given off. This is, so this so again, it's just the exact opposite. Uh, well, I say exact opposite. The opposite. I hate to use the word exact, but for practical purposes, the exact opposite of what happened over here. Over here, the electrons and hydrogen ions ended up on oxygen. Okay, and that's what what you know the oxygen and we breathe in. That's where it ends up. It ends up as water in our bodies. Over in, in photosynthesis, water is going to be broken apart. And the ele hydrogen and electrons are going to go through that, that electron transport system with O2 being the waste product. Or byproduct. I hate to say waste product, it sounds like that. Is it because the plants byproduct. use the water as a nutrient? Is it because the plants use the water as a nutrient? Well, I, I don't use it as a nutrient. I'm going to say, no, we need water too. We know. need it, but, but we don't. I wouldn't use it as a nutrient. They have, but, they, but in this case, you know, if I, so if I set it on an exam to you, if I set it on an exam, what is the origin of the electrons and hydrogen ions? that goes through the electron transport system of photosynthesis, the origin of the electrons in, in hydrogen ions is water. And, and, and what's the byproduct, what's given off in the process? Oxygen. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what I want you to know, right here. That the origin of the electrons that get excited by the So electrons. the water accepts the energy So in somehow, the first place. and by the way, it's still not totally understood how, but somehow, you know, energy of light's coming in. Excites. Somehow causes that, that, that excitement. water to be broken into hydrogen ions and electrons and oxygen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. No. It's wild. It's wild. So it is pretty much the opposite. Just, I think it's just so neat to see how this works. So far, are you okay? All right. Now, the light reaction. It's called the light reaction because you have to have energy of light to do this without mm -hmm. turning off the sun and it stops working, right? So it does doesn't that happen at night, in other words. The dark reaction is called the dark reaction because you don't need the light to be shining for it to work. It'll work whether the light's shining or not. It depends upon taking the things that you made in the light reaction to complete the rest of the process. Mm -hmm. So the dark reaction, and this is the one called the problem cycle. Um, I'll just put here the the uh, the products of the light reaction. What are the products of the light reaction? ATP. ATP and then ADP. Yeah, those two things. I don't care if you say if you call it NADPH or the reduced coenzyme. I mean, I'm not really worried about the have all the details on it. So the products of the light reaction are used to to fix and reduce CO2 molecules to make sure to make glucose. Fix and reduce. See, don't get, see, yeah, that's why I have to occasionally talk about oxidation reduction. <sighs> I remember way back, oh God, a week and a half ago or whatever, I was saying that you know the complete breakdown of glucose in you know, cellular respiration, you could also say it's the complete oxidation of glucose. The glucose is totally oxidized to CO2. Or the carbon from glucose. Totally oxidized. 
to CO2. You can't get any more oxidized than CO2. Whereas glucose is relatively reduced. It's not as reduced as, uh, you know, uh, the most reduced you could have for carbon, I'll just write it down, you know, I don't have to write it down. If you had, let's say we took six carbon, one, two, three, four, five, or six, the most reduced we could get would be this. All these would be hydrogens here. That's the most reduced form of hydrogen. Of, 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 of carbon, carbon would be having all these would be hydrogens where I, where I have all these covalent bonds, you know. Glucose, sugar, somewhere in between. It's got some some hydrogens. It's got some OHs here. It's got, you know, it's got an OH over here. You know, it's got it's got a combination thing. So it's not completely reduced. They're a lot more reduced than carbon dioxide. Now you don't need to know this. I'm just trying to give you some words so they have some meaning to. Them. All right, so um, <coughs> first of all, what's that word fix? Let's fix me. Let's do, um, what do I mean by fixing nitrogen, fixing carbon, uh, fixing your dog or cat? No, I said that's different, right? Yeah, yeah so yeah. fix means set. <laughs> what does fix mean when we're talking about, about molecules? And Living the cell. <coughs> Hooking them on the organic molecules. So no, fix them too. Fix, fixing carbon or carbon dioxide, however you want to say it. Fixing carbon dioxide is really what we're using. Fixing carbon dioxide means attaching it to a it to an organic molecule. Okay. And by the way, this is all part of that. That's the dark reaction. This is the uh, Calvin cycle. And I'm not going to get into details. It's complicated, but, you know. but that's what fixing means. But again, CO, CO2, keep in mind, CO2 is totally oxidized, it's totally stable. You know, to try to get CO2 hooked on to something, you gotta force it. How are you gonna force it? ATP! Yeah! Energy, you gotta force it with putting some energy in the system. What energy are you gonna use? ATP! Okay, so that, so, so, so fixing carbon dioxide means attaching to organic molecules, and it needs to be forced. To do it. Like Congress. Meaning, meaning, energy must be used. ATP. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's, what, that's, that's a whole idea that, you know. That's, I mean, you could say that would be the function of all that ATP that you're making in that light reaction. <laughs> just to, well, not, it's not all used just to fix, but, but to a great extent it's used to fix that carbon dioxide, hooking the carbon dioxide onto these organic molecules. And the ultimate, the ultimate thing is that six carbons and six waters will end up with, with one glucose. But you don't do six carbon dioxides all at once. You're actually taking a molecule, a five carbon molecule, hooking a, a, a carbon dioxide onto it, and do some other things, and another carbon dioxide. Anyway, it's a, but it's a, ultimately, that is the, the end product. It's a lot more complicated than just looking at that uh, chemical reaction. Yeah. So, what molecule would you do? versus interdine? So, this, but see, here we're using up ATP to force this. Keep in mind, I've got to remind you just just, just re briefly you know when you have some molecule of all these uh, covalent bonds it, you know they don't necessarily just form the covalent bonds just because that's ah, something to do I mean you, you know they, it takes energy to make those covalent bonds so if you can break the covalent bonds you can get energy out in the case of this we're trying to hook the co2 on it's going to take energy to put it on and we'll get that energy by breaking up some ATP so those are what we call coupled kinds of reactions. You know, you, you're doing two reactions at once. Once one that requires an energy input, the other that gives that energy. Yeah. All right.
But still, okay, if we just attach a carbon dioxide to a cell with a fairly oxidized molecule, we want glucose, which is much more reduced than that. We're, we need a reducing agent. What is going to be our reducing agent? That reduces the enzyme. enzyme, yeah. When you're adding the carbon, does that make it an inorganic molecule? No, 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 because we have it. We already have an organic molecule. We're just putting another carbon onto it. Just a long. But is that carbon dioxide is inorganic? Yeah, you know. But once it gets fixed, now it's part of. It's no longer carbon dioxide. Outside, yeah. It's part of another molecule. Okay. So it's now organic. Yeah. So, so, okay, so fixing carbon dioxide means attaching to an organic molecule, and it means energy in the form of ATP, which we made in the light reactor. This is all dark reactor. Dark reactor. Well, it's this. Then, then the, the fixed carbon. So we do have one carbon dioxide at a time. We can't just take, it, it sounds easy there. It sounds like, oh, we just take six carbon dioxides and hook them together. No, no, no. This is hooked onto another molecule, and another is hooked onto another molecule, and then there are all these other, re anyway, it all comes out in the end, but whatever. Then the fixed carbon is reduced to make sugar, glucose. Again, this is, I'm oversimplifying on purpose, but this is the ultimate thing that would happen. Uh, but how it's reduced by an ATPH. The reduced coenzyme. So the energy from the ATP is used to break apart the bonds and make it smaller. Well, wait, in this case, we broke, ATP was broken up to make a bigger molecule. Mm, okay. Right, because we hooked a CO2 onto another molecule. Okay. But this gets a little bit smaller. Um, okay, the reduced coenzyme made in light reaction. Back up here, this ATP here. This ATP, up here. Made in. The light reaction. So let's just make sure we know what we're talking about here. Let's just stop for a second. So, photosynthesis. What are we trying to do? We're trying to make glucose out of water and carbon dioxide. Okay. Both highly stable molecules, highly, uh, 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 well, that's carbon dioxide. It's highly <coughs> oxidized, or most oxidized you get. And yet we want to get the carbon in a less oxidized form, more reduced form. Um, ah. And how are we going to do all this? Well, it turns out in the chloroplasts we have all these various pigment molecules that can absorb the energy of light. And in the process of absorbing light, um, let's go down here the light reaction. We actually have an electron transport system, similar kind of thing of what we've talked about with the electron transport system before. And in the process of those excited electrons going through the uh, electron transfer system, we make ATP and then ADPH. And then we use those two things. We use the ATP in part to fix the carbon dioxide and the NADPH to reduce it to get it into a reduced okay. form, which we call okay. sugar. So what does reducing mean? Right? It means it means adding electrons. Oxidation oh, is, yeah, the, yeah. is the loss of a, I mean, most of the time, a pair of electrons and the hydrogen, reducing this gain of electrons and hydrogens. And what I was saying is, you know, you took, say we had an organic molecule. It's misleading. Here, you see with, with the, you know, these oxygens. Well, we don't want just a double bonded oxygen here. We can't have another double bonded oxygen. But we, we can add up like that. We might have like that, something like that. But that would be reducing it. So now we reduce the. Thing. Something like that. It's not quite that simple, but basically that's the idea. Mm -hmm. um, just keep in mind that sugars are kind of in the medium range of being reduced. And in terms of energy, the more reduced the compound is, the more potential energy you, could, you have if you convert it. If it's really oxidized like CO2, you can't get any energy out. It's as stable as you can get, right? But something like you know, if I had just all carbon and hydrogen, just <laughs> energy. Sugars are somewhere in between. 
They've got a lot of energy available. And they're, they work for living things. Those long carbons. Well, the carbons and hydrogens are like fatty acids. A lot of energy there. Does it? Um, does light and dark reactions have anything to do with, like, say, like, night and day? Well, of course, this is only, I mean, other than using light. a grow light or something, this only occurs when the light and when the sun is Yeah, the light and dark reactions can only occur during the day. During the day. The dark reaction can, can, can occur whenever there is ATP and then ATP. So they'll start working during the day, but they can keep working. They probably still have a bunch left over, and they'll keep on working during the night. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so um, if I said, okay, so photosynthesis, what is the idea of photosynthesis? You tell me you want to make glucose. And I'd say, okay, fine, out of what? And you say, well, CO2 and water. Yeah, but that's not easy to do. Well, you're going to use the energy of sun to do it. And I said, okay, good. How? How are you going to use the energy of the sun? Well, it turns out that the energy of the sun can be used to excite electrons. They can go through an electron transport system. And in the process of doing that, they make a whole bunch of these. ATPs and serious coenzymes. And once you have these guys available, they can go through these series of reactions, which are, they're not like, I mean, they're different from the Krebs cycle, but it's got, it's, and it's, you can think of it as reverse the Krebs cycle. It's not nearly that simple. It's far more complicated, but you can see that the light reaction is sort of like the electron transfer system of mitochondria. The dark reaction is sort of like the Krebs cycle. E, at least it's analogous. We'll kind of say in reverse. But anyway, so once you get NAD and pH and, and, and ATP, then you can fix the carbon dioxides and reduce them to make sure. Okay. Does that make some sense? And then if I said, hey, that's fine, but you talked about electron transfer system. Where do the electrons come from that are going through this? And you go, well, break down of water. The breakdown of water. <laughs> okay. Where do they come from? I said water. I should say the breakdown of water. Let's put that. Jesus. <coughs> Ultimately come from the breakdown. So when water gets broken down, you get hydrogen and electrons, and, and, and I, doesn't oxygen come off? Where does the oxygen come from that comes off the plants? Water. From the water. And I break down water. Okay. So it all kind of, you know, it all sort of fits together. Now, the whole process is a lot more complicated. I don't think we need to go through all the complications and the complicated stuff. This is enough for our purposes, for my purposes, that you at least see this. And you see there is this... You know, relationship between photosynthesis. An anal analogy between photosynthesis as sort of like the, re the opposite, sort of, of, uh, of uh, respiration, uh, respiration, sort of the opposite. In, in, in overall terms, it, they are the opposite. Yeah. In terms of the reaction, of course, you know, there's some similarities to the reaction, but it's complicated. We don't need to worry about the details. And keep in mind, this fuels. Life on Earth. Yep. You know, without photosynthesis, <laughs> none of us get energy. Wouldn't be plants, here. Yeah. And and now I did mention, and I said you didn't need to worry about it, that some bacteria photosynthesize, but they don't give off oxygen. They give off something else. The origin of their electrons is from some other molecule, not from not from water, but from some other molecule. Some of them, one of them, um, the origin is from hydrogen sulfide, and so they give off sulfur as a byproduct instead of oxygen. We don't need to worry about those. There's some others, some give off hydrogen gases, you know, but there's several other possibilities. We, there's nothing we need to worry about. It's, it's, it's important for them, but for our purposes, no. But, but So there are some photosynthesizing bacteria that don't give off oxygen. But all blue greens and all chloroplasts more or less do the same thing. The different blue greens are a little bit different in some of their pigments and all that from the, from the uh, chloroplasts, but there is that one. Blue green is almost identical to chloroplast. So anyway, but the main thing is they all give off water, meaning that what's the origin of the water? Oh, they give off oxygen. What's the origin of the water? Of the oh, <laughs> I just <laughs> keep telling you the answer when I'm trying to ask the question. Right? <laughs> 
If they're giving off oxygen, what's the origin of the oxygen? Water. 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 And if there's an electron transfer system, what's the origin of electrons? The hydrogen? Water. Water. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And by the way, you know, we didn't have cellular respiration on the last exams. We will be on this next exam along with photosynthesis. And I want you to see that relationship in terms of, you know. We didn't have Krebs? And Krebs no, we didn't. ETS versus photosynthesis and uh, ETS in the Calvin cycle. Without going into any more detail than this, but just so you see the big picture. That's why I want you to see the big picture. If I had you memorize a bunch of reactions, you'd get lost in your reactions. But if you see the big picture, that's the big picture. How do I like you? Are you guys with me? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Let's. I think that was all I really was going to tell you about this. If you do read about it, and you, you can get. Don't. Uh, I'll just tell you something. I'm not going to talk about it other than just tell you, and it's not going to be on the exam. If you read about it, you'll get in, you'll get bogged down in detail. But when you do the light reaction, the actual light reactions, they say they call them photosystems, and they say there's a photosystem one and two. But when you read about it, you go, wait a minute, photosystem two comes first, and photosystem one comes second, huh? And it's because when they discovered all this stuff, you know, when they were they discovered to, it in reverse the order. one that they call photosystem one is when they learned about first, they discovered first. But in terms of what's happening in the reactions, it's the second one. And then they, you know. So again, you know, the numbers, don't worry about it. But you don't need to worry about the different two different photosystems. One photosystem mainly gives an ATP. The other gives some ATP and an ADP. And by the way, I'll say this, but it's not going to be on the exam. Remember how I said there had to be some final acceptor of the electrons and the hydrogen? Well, this is this is arc reaction, sorry. Um, but remember in... Uh, electron transfer system, final acceptor of electrons, and it was oxygen. oxygen, right? Well, there has to be some final acceptor of the electrons and hydrogens in the light reaction, and the final acceptor is NADP+. Plus. And when it grabs those electrons and hydrogens, it becomes NADP. I'm not going to put that on the exam. I'm not going to write that down. So really know, but that is the final acceptor. But it's cool that you can track where all the molecule or all the atoms go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, then you it makes it makes sense when you see that. Okay. Well, now we've got to get into another huge topic. We'll just barely begin it, um, and that is about DNA and uh, RNA and protein. And oh my God. We can start it. We have another lecture on this on, on Wednesday, so we'll at least start it. Let's start this uh, genetic research. This is going to be a, an historical idea there. Okay. Just go to watch the video and then we'll just say what is the thing. If you want, I'll send you an email. Austin and Crick. Hmm. Double helix. Nineteen fifty-three. We'll talk about the replication of DNA. I don't think we'll get to this today, but I'll put it down. I'm sure we won't put it Replication of DNA, but this is the next So let's just start. Let's just start all this stuff. Uh, so new topic: DNA. Um, the instruction booklet. Say it again. What? Uh, instruction booklet. Yes, yes. <coughs> DNA. So, um, let's just put down what we know about DNA. We said it's an information molecule. Originally, they didn't know this, of course. But, you know, they've known about DNA since oh God, the mid 1800s. They would take mm -hmm. things like uh, <coughs> salmon eggs or something like that and extract a material that they called. Nuclein. That was just a term that the people back about 1850s had called nuclein because they got it from the nucleus of these salmon eggs or whatever eggs they used. Uh, and then they, you know, started to characterize it to find out what's in nuclein and all that. And then, so then, the, when they found out more about it, they, they used the term nucleic acid. Um, 
So let's write, let's put down what we know so far about the book of Exodus. Uh, it's a macromolecule, right? Yeah. Large unit, right? <laughs> Made of small molecules. Write this down. So DNA. Made of nucleotide. Made of nucleotides. So let's talk about what is a nucleotide? Let's talk about a nucleotide. Amino acid. No, not, not, I heard an amino acid. Uh uh. Uh uh. uh, uh, uh the no, acid. that's a macromolecule. Those aren't monomers. Nucleotides are made of three components a phosphate, a sugar, uh, and a There you go. We just had that lab today, didn't we? <laughs> Go ahead, phosphate. Phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitro. Okay, uh, five carbon sugar. For D I mean, we're talking DNA, so let's put down the names of the sugar. Bless you. Deoxyribose. <laughs> when we talk about RNA, the sugar is called ribose. For DNA, it's called deoxyribose. The only difference is that there's one less oxygen on this molecule. Not a big deal for us. It's a big deal for DNA and RNA, but not for us. Okay. That's, that's two compounds. The third component is what they call a nitrophy, nit a nitrogenous base. All that means is it's got nitrogen in it. It's got carbons and hydrogen and oxygen, too, but it's got nitrogens. Nitrogenous base. Okay, uh, so these are the three components of a nucleotide. Let's just let's talk about their four different ones, four different bases, four different ones. And we'll just we we'll use the letter uh, A equals adenine, but you don't have to memorize the, the, the names, just the letters. A T equals thymine. C equals cytosine, and G equals bromine. <clears throat> so, again, you don't need to worry, need to worry about the names, just the letters, A, T, C, and G. Um, and uh, so there are four different, different bases. And the way these guys fit together, so look like this. Oops, this one. So here's the phosphate, and here's the base. So this is the ribose or deoxyribose. Little d ribose. Oh, I'll just say deoxyribose. Not quite an accurate picture. If you want to really be technical, well, usually when you have corners like this, you're talking about carbon compounds. So every time you reach it, it's a corner, it's a there's a carbon there. Yeah. And that's true here, except that technically right here there's an oxygen, and this carbon is actually up over here attached to the phosphate. I'm not going to draw it in. I'm going to oversimplify it. So, so, so there's a nucleotide. It's made of three things. It's got this whatever the base is, and we'll put with the letter A or T or C or G, or, you know, whatever. All right. Now, I said that this was back at least 150 years ago. They knew about the DNA, and they knew what it was made of. Uh, and I also know, you know, that by doing a lot of observation, we're going to be looking in the microscope next to the leaf at cells that are dividing. They knew that every time a cell divides, the material in the nucleus, you know, gets transferred to the... Well, when a cell divides, they talk, they'd say that there's the original cell, and then when you get two new cells from it, they're called daughter cells. It has nothing to do with daughters or sons. It's just a term they always use is daughter cells. But the two daughter cells then have this, this, the material that was in the nucleus. So this is the nuclear material. They also said it's the genetic material, meaning it's being passed on from generation to generation. It's being passed on from every time a cell divides, or it's in the sperm and, 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 and eggs, so it's passed on from generation to generation. But what is in the nucleus? It's about 50% protein, about 50% nucleic acid. And they knew that proteins did a lot of work. Well, they're the worker molecules, right? Mm -hmm. So they knew that proteins did a lot of work. 
what about these nucleic acid thingies? Uh, what are they doing? No idea. They have no idea. So if you asked a biologist 100 years ago, you know, 150, well, 100 years ago, you know, what is the genetic material? They say, well, probably protein. Because proteins have so many other functions, it just seems that maybe they would, it would be the genetic material. And other people say, no, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, maybe it's not, maybe that, the nucleic acids may have, must have some function. Well, maybe this is packing material, you know. <laughs> no, well, who knows? So, those that nobody knew. And, um, so, but it was hypothesized by many that maybe it was a nucleic acid. But look at the difference. What is a, what's an amino acid? What's a protein? Let's put this down. Proteins. Made from amino Proteins acids. Are made of made of what? Amino acids. Made of amino acids. No, no relationship. You're made of amino acids. And how many different amino acids are there? Roughly twenty. About twenty, right? Mm -hmm. So if there, God, there's twenty different amino acids, say you can make proteins of all sizes, shapes, structures, and everything else, and they have all kinds of functions. We know that. But nucleotides are only four different ones. That sounds like there's not a lot of information there available. So how could nucleic acids be the genetic information when it's maybe kind of boring, only four different possible nucleotides to make this, these nucleic acids? So, so back and forth and back and forth, people who argue about it and trying to do experiments. Finally, in 1944, there was a brilliant series of experiments. And it was the first, first experiments that proved that DNA was a genetic material, not protein. Brilliant work. Experiments that proved that DNA was the genetic material. So far to the end of the World War II. Not protein. As previously thought. Okay, but here's the deal, it's really weird, you know. It's a brilliant series of experiments, really well done. But you know, to prove these things you have to purify, you know, the DNA away from the proteins there. And and then show that it still is, is you know is functioning as a genetic material, and and so you know to be you know, to be technical there was like one percent of the stuff they were that they were had purified one percent protein ninety nine percent genetic I mean DNA, and so they said this is almost completely pure and is still functioning as a genetic material it must be the genetic material the DNA. And there were still some biologists that said, wait a minute, there is this contamination of 1% protein. Maybe that 1% protein is really... So, but most people pretty much believe that it was a DNA. There was another series of experiments in 1952. Again, an interesting experiment. 1952, second, second type of other experiments. Um, notice this is during the Second World War, so, you know, there's not a little too much time, you know, available resources to be doing scientific work, but it, other than bombs and stuff, you know. Anyway, but then I can give you other experiments that, that also proved it. But, you know, the thing was that um, these experiments, in terms of the purity and all that of the, of the results, wasn't nearly as pure a, a set of results. But, by then, even, even though they weren't as perfect an experiment, by then there was Essentially, no doubt. Everyone said, yes, it's got this DNA. It's no longer, we can just forget protein as a genetic material. We can't forget protein because they're the worker molecules on cells, but we can, we can now when we're going to talk about genetic material, it's, it's DNA. That's easy. Um, but still, only four nucleotides. That doesn't sound like it's got very much information. Uh, how can we do it? Well, so there were people that were trying to figure out what DNA was like. You know, they want to, if they could figure out the structure, that might help them determine something about it. And so they're doing all kinds of people are trying all kinds of experiments. And um, Watson and Crick, okay, these these were they're kind of interesting people because um, Watson was this kind of brash uh, American, very very bright guy, um, 
who had gotten his PhD, gone over to, he went to Denmark to do a postdoc, and he went down to uh, uh, Cambridge after his postdoc and, and met this guy named Crick and was working in this lab where they were doing X-ray crystallography. And he was learning about X-ray crystallography. And he met Crick. Crick was a little older, very proper British person, and he, um, he, he was a physical scientist rather than a biologist. And he'd been in the war, and, and so that's why he was uh, a little older, and he was working on his PhD. And they were working under this, this guy named Sir Lawrence Bragg, who was gotten a PhD for, I mean, a, no, a Nobel Prize for all of his good crystallography. So it's a beautiful lab for doing crystallography. And so Watson is this kind of brash character. He's, he's learning about crystallography. And it was Watson, who was trained as a biologist, who said to Crick, you know, the really interesting question here is, DNA, the structure. What is the structure of DNA? We, we need to find that out because I'm sure that's going to be very important. Crick got Crick all excited about it, so they started working on it. And there were times when they were working on this, trying to figure out the structure, and that Lawrence Bragg, come on, come on you guys, you've got other things to do. Ignore this other stuff. Who cares about DNA, you know? Uh, but they were working on it and working on it. <coughs> and um, they got some information from this other lab, uh, this woman, Rosalind Franklin, and, and was working for a guy named Maurice Wilkins, and he, she had purified some DNA and made some good X-ray crystallography type pictures of it, X-ray crystallographs, and showed it to Watson, and he looks at it and goes, double helix. Now, the, the helix was kind of in the air at the time because uh, Linus Pauling, who was probably the most famous American chemist, um, he was down at Caltech. He had come up with some of the structure, structural components of proteins, and one of them was an alpha helix. And if you ever read about proteins, you read about alpha, an alpha helix. What's, I mean, uh, 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 Linus Pauling came up with that. Linus Pauling is very interesting because he has two Nobel Prizes. He's not alive. Mm. He had two Nobel Prizes. He got one in chemistry and one in peace. He was really very anti-nuclear bombs and stuff like that. But anyway. But back, back, um, back to the, the thing in DNA. So, so Watson comes back to Crick and says, it's a double helix. So we've got to try to figure it out. So they were trying to build models. And they built one model that was totally wrong. People just laughed at him and the moon blew up. That was a mistake. Then, then um, Peter Pauling came to work in their lab. Peter Pauling was the son of Linus Pauling. And um, Linus Pauling knew that, that Watson and Crick were working on the model, and he said, you know, I'm working on the model of DNA. Um, can you tell me what you know yet? <laughs> and they go. So they talk to Peter Pauling. Well, how much does your dad know? I don't think he knows a whole lot. Well, we can't give him the information right now because that guy's brilliant. He'll come up with the, you know, he'll come up with the model before we just say, we're not quite ready to give our what information we know. So they kind of worked on it, worked on it, and they got some new information, and they came up with this brilliant model, 1953, where I have it uh, they came up with oh, there, over there. Brilliant model. Uh, yeah, it was a year after that, 1953. Um, and the model turned out to be absolutely beautiful. I mean, just, just as a work of art, if you want to think of it that way, an absolutely beautiful model. And from the model, they could make all kinds of predictions about how DNA worked. Now, here's the thing. And I said this in, in I said in lecture, the lab this morning, you were in there. In science, this is probably true in other things too, but this is true for science. If you know the right question to ask, you might be able to get the answer. But you have to know the right question to ask, okay? And which really means you have to have a certain amount of information before you can know what the next question to ask. And so if you want to ask the question, how does DNA work? Well, who knows? Once they had the model of DNA, they could look at that model and go, oh, whoa, we, we can look at this model and listen and give us ideas of how DNA works. How it can work as the genetic material to be transferred from generation to generation to generation. How it can work to direct the activities of the cell. Just from looking at the model. Okay? In fact, they, they, when they first wrote the thing up, it was a short little article, you know, just several, about the new ribo, deoxyribonucleic acid. There's a, a model of it. And they, put, they sent it in. And they had this little paragraph. It has not escaped our notice that the model can predict blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and, I, and it was so understated. It has not escaped our notice. The point was, whoa, well, look at this model. We can come up with all kinds of ideas, which means all kinds of experiments he was being to try to figure out how everything works in the cell. And this was really the, the, the model of Watson Crick's model of DNA um, was the origin of what I would call modern molecular biology. This started the whole molecular biology boom, uh, 1953 on, and all kinds of Nobel prizes were, were uh, won for you know from doing all kinds of good molecular biology work. And without that model, they wouldn't have been able to do all that work. I mean, you, you wouldn't know exactly how to ask that question. But anyway, we'll we'll talk about some of that. By the way, just just to give you some interesting, you know. I don't. I never met Linus Pauling, but at Berkeley, I worked for a professor who was the first person to get his PhD under Linus Pauling. You know, is that a big deal? No. <laughs> but, uh, to, to some of us, it is. I mean, really, when, when we're one student away from a Nobel yeah, Prize, yeah, yeah, it yeah, makes yeah, us right. feel better. And it does. And of course, don't forget, I was in a lab that they got the Nobel. Prize. Yeah, I know. That's I what I'm saying. I didn't have anything to do with the Nobel Prize work, as I mentioned. Before. What are you putting your books away for? I'm still. I got five minutes. I got seven minutes. <laughs> oh, that's that's How's that? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so let, let me just let me just give you a real quick preview of what we're going to talk about. Just a quick preview. This will be. I mean, you know, you'll see what's happening. We're, we're, we're going to finish. We're going to talk about the DNA model, okay? And then we're going to talk about RNAs. Uh, and protein synthesis. And it turns out, it turns out that RNA, there are three types. And, and, they, and they all three are involved in protein synthesis in one way or another. So let's just, let me, let, let's just, we'll talk about the DNA model, but let me just give you this. So, this is the, this is an important idea, so I want you to write this down. And that is that DNA DNA we say it's information, it doesn't do any work. But DNA has the information or is the information is, is the, has the information to tell the cell how to make proteins. So it's the information, as I said, DNA doesn't do any work. It has information to tell the cell. But now it turns out that DNA is in the nucleus and always is in the nucleus. Proteins are made in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus. So that information has to get from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Well, and that's where RNA comes in. But we'll get to that on, on, on Wednesday. Okay, uh, the word gene. The word gene is... Um, a, you know, so DNA is this long double-stranded thing, which we'll talk about on, on Wednesday. But a gene is a segment, a portion, a linear segment, a linear portion, whatever. A linear, linear just means a straight line, you know. A linear portion of DNA with the information. I'm just say info. Make one protein. So when we talk about genes, that's what we're talking about. It, you know, it's a gene to make a protein. You, you can get more detail on the definition of gene, but this is fine. We, so what they usually say is one gene, one protein. Actually, the way it originally started when people did some. People were using the word gene for years without knowing what it, what it really meant, and, and it was back in the 19, late 1930s and early 40s that some people did some experiments on, on um, uh, fungi, some molds, and they came up with the idea, one gene, one enzyme. <coughs> what is a gene? Is a gene is information to tell how to make one enzyme. Well, now it's a little more general because we, we say one gene, one protein. So if I use the word gene, I'm just talking about a segment of DNA has the information to make one protein. Because we're going to be working our way up to protein synthesis. And I 
I said this to you before, you know, if you ask me what's the one most important function that's occurring in the cell at any one moment, and I had to get an answer, I said, well, protein synthesis. Because proteins are the worker molecules, they're doing all the work. Proteins don't last long, they're constantly being breaking down, making being remade, breaking down, being remade, that's fine. So the one single most important, from my perspective, important function of uh, this occurring in a cell at any time would be protein synthesis. How do you make proteins? Well, first of all, you need information how to make them. The DNA has that information, and, and for each protein, we, we, we call it that, that information is gene. And then next time we're going to see how DNA gets together with, R I mean, we make RNA, there's copies of DNA, we get, they go down to ribosomes, and blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Blah, blah, blah. Hey. All right, we'll quit early. I'll give you two extra one minute off. See you, too.